You know, it doesn't matter what walk of life you come from, your race, religion, whatever. Chances are that the legacy of HBCUs and their graduates affect more than one aspect of your everyday life. HBCU Big Hi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Welcome aboard. Welcome to a new episode of HBC Ubiquity. I'm your host, Thomas Joyner Jr. Question, and in the words of Langston Hughes, what happens to a dream deferred? There are currently 101 HBCUs in operation today in the United States and the U.S. Virgin Islands, but our number was diminished by one in 2018 when Concordia College closed in Selma, Alabama. So what happens to the students that are enrolled there when a college shuts its doors down permanently? How does that affect the alumni? How does that affect and reflect upon us as HBCUs? In this episode, we'll discuss this and more with Dr. James Lyons, the final president of Concordia College. Now, let this episode be a warning to those of us that love and support our HBCU alma maters. Whether you hear something in this episode that is somewhat reminiscent of your HBCU or one that you know of, or even if it doesn't, this week's episode should serve as a caution as to what can happen when one of our own is in dire need. So let's get started with this conversation. Welcome to HBCU Ubiquity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Welcome back to HBC Ubiquity. I'm joined now by the last president of Concordia College in Selma, Alabama, Dr. James Lines. Dr. Lines, good afternoon. How are you today? Fine. How are you today? Everything is well down here. Hot but well. Well, it's hot in Atlanta, but, <laughs> but well. Dr. Lines, can you briefly tell the listeners the uh, story of how Con- Concordia came to be? Well, I can. Uh, Concordia College uh, has a very interesting history. Um, a woman, an Alabamian, by the name of Rosa Young, uh, was very concerned about educating her people, uh, the poorest of Alabamians. And she wanted to make certain that they had a basic education. That later turned into wanting to train teachers and preachers. But anyway, she wanted to be sure that her people had the opportunity for an education. So she started her school and her plan was to go around Alabama and start a number of schools. But she didn't have the resources. So in order to get some help, she called uh, or contacted Dr. Booker T. Washington, uh, who was at Tuskegee Institute at the time. And she asked Booker T. Washington for his help. And he indicated uh, that he didn't personally uh, have the resources to help her, but he referred her to the Lutheran uh, Synodical Conference, uh, and he told her that from all he had observed, the Lutheran Church was doing more for his race, their race, than anybody else at the time, and she ought to reach out to the Lutherans. So she did uh, follow Booker T's instructions and got letters out to the Lutheran churches uh, and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, responded. And the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, sent a preacher to Alabama to uh, meet with Rosa Young. And he was so impressed that the church then came back and said, okay, we're going to support you. And they went throughout the, the state of Alabama starting schools uh, for children. And, and in some of these schools, they had places of worship. And then some of the churches they started had schools. So it was uh, uh, through the efforts of Rosa Young uh, that Concordia College eventually uh, came into existence. It started as a high school and as a secondary school and then a junior college and then finally on to a four-year institution by the name of uh, Concordia College. It's a part of the Concordia University uh, system of 10 institutions. So it was Rosa Young's vision uh, that allowed Concordia College to do what it did for some 96 years. And Dr. Lyons, you've mentioned, you know, the Lutheran College in that, you know, in that response a couple of times. Just, just expand upon that a little bit more. What role did the, did the Lutheran Church have in the establishment? Of, oh, what role did they play in terms of uh, supporting the, the, the college and its, um, you know, its existence? Well, certainly uh, their finances. Uh, Rosa Young could not have started schools by herself. So the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, actually put the money up uh, so that uh, Rosa Young could go around the state and, and start schools and start her education program. 
And over the years, the, then the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, provided financial support uh, for the school to operate. Uh, then, uh, uh, and, and also many of the uh, people in the Lutheran Church as individuals stepped up to uh, support the institution. And you had people of wealth uh, providing uh, big dollars for facilities on the campus uh, and helping to create an endowment. So the Lutheran Church was, was very fundamental and very supportive of uh, Rosa Young's dream. So Dr. Lyons, how does an HBCU like Concordia cease to exist? You know, the, the challenge for all private institutions, and let, let me, I know you asked specifically about Concordia, but private independent uh, denominational colleges and universities all over the country are having challenges today. Uh, since 2016, there have been about 30 independent colleges and universities and music conservatories, art schools, that have either closed or merged or consolidated uh, as a part of another institution. Uh, so things in general have been tough for private institutions. They have had trouble competing for students, uh, trying to keep the tuition low and compete with community colleges and four-year public institutions. Uh, and denominational institutions have found that uh, that pipeline that was almost a guarantee where if you were black in a Lutheran church, folk were going to send you to Concordia College. There was no question about it. And some of our uh, Baptist churches and AME churches right. and Methodist churches have done the same thing over the years for their institutions. But as students decide to go up and do their own thing and go to other institutions, etc., it becomes increasingly difficult to, to, to hold on. And that's what happened to, to Concordia College. I think that the church began to look at it more along the lines of uh, a business and return on investments. And, you know, how do we justify with all the needs we have for the church movement? How do we justify uh, providing operation money and keeping the school uh, financially sound, and now only a small percentage of the students there are Lutheran, and they're not the only uh, place that uh, is training teachers and preachers. And so I think that, uh, you know, you get a different look, a different focus, and, and, and that's a problem because a school like Concordia College, if you look at Rosa Young's dream, it becomes a mission, not necessarily a business. And if you focus on it as a mission, then you say, uh, in spite of the fact that the majority of the students are no longer Lutheran, we are serving black Alabamians for the most part. We're serving some of the uh, poorest students in the state consistent with Rosa Young's dream. So that's important to the church. And if we're godly, you know, you want to think that uh, uh, we can move forward and continue to be supportive of this mission. But uh, that was not what happened. And so maybe about 10 years ago, the church started to uh, pull back its resources and take a different look at the institution. The institution tried to find investors. And actually, at one point, uh, when I arrived, we were talking to a major investor from Taiwan who had expressed interest in uh, supporting Concordia College, uh, uh, making a big infusion of cash, and yet maintaining its mission to serve the poorest of, of black folks in Alabama. But that particular uh, deal fell through, and uh, there was no other hope. And so the college was sold uh, to someone and uh, shut its doors. Dr. Lyons, and, and, and thank you for that answer. And you said a lot in that. that I want to actually uh, go back a little bit for to, 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 to expand upon a few of your points. Uh, the first one I want to expand upon is what I, something I heard you say that I want to make sure our listeners hear that, that I, I felt was very key. And that is these problems that are that are affecting church affiliated private institutions are not just restricted to HBCUs. 
non HBCUs are non HBCUs are feeling this heat as well. Would you agree? That that it, it is not strictly an HBCU problem. That is correct. Um, most of the private schools that are closing are not HBCU. So uh, we, we, we have to be very clear and very careful uh, that we don't uh, try to uh, cast this whole issue as simply an HBCU issue. Mm. But it is compounded for the HBCU in the fact that we have had a history of challenges and being underserved and trying to educate the, the, the poorest of students etc. Uh, and so uh, it, we, it's, I call it a double whammy. You know, you're, you're an HBCU, you're still fighting to convince people that there is a justification in 2019 for continuing an HBCU, yet you have all of these other problems uh, that independent denominational colleges are having. Okay, and with that said, Dr. Lyons, I want to I want to expand that to a second point that I heard you mention earlier that um, this is even though, and for those that don't know, Dr. Lyons has been uh, president at private institutions, public HBCUs, uh, secretary of higher education for state of Maryland. So you're you're seasoned with this with with your knowledge, and so with that said, what would you say to other private HBCU institutions that are facing some of the same pressures from? Uh, their nominational supports that you said Concordia was facing? Well, the the, the first thing I say to uh, colleagues and friends, alumni, etc., uh, and thank you for acknowledging my 50 years in higher education, uh, I have seen a lot. And what I say, the first thing that hit me is this can happen to your institution if you're not vigilant. Wow. That's the most important thing. This can happen to your institution if you're not vigilant. And, and, and everybody has to be vigilant. The board of trustees, the administration and senior staff, alumni, students, uh, corporate and, and business supporters, this can happen to you. Um, you know, because it happened to Concordia College 96 years later. So that, that, that's the, that to me is, is, is important for people to understand because um, we, 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 we don't get a pass in this thing. Uh, we can't say that, well, because we're an HBCU, we deserve to survive. Having your doors closed can happen to you. The, 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 and then the other thing I say to people is we do have to look at the warning signals. Um, and again, that's the responsibility of the boards of trustees and the senior administrators. When do you know you're in trouble? What are the signs that you are beginning to have some problems? And then what do you do about them? What, what, what's the game plan? You know, what are those things that... Uh, should tip you off to the fact that, that wow, we, we, we've got some issues here. Uh, that one of the things that was a constant challenge for Concordia College, Alabama, is the fact that because it was founded and its purpose was to serve the poorest of students, the institution could not charge the kind of tuition that it needed uh, to sustain the institution and the operation. I don't want to get into people's numbers and the private business, but I can say to you that when I went to Concordia College in May of um, 2017, one of the things that was evident to me right off was that Concordia College, Alabama, a private institution, had the lowest tuition in the state of Alabama. And I said, well, you know, how can this be? I said to myself, and I did talk to the CFO, you know, how can this be the, the lowest tuition in the state of Alabama? You, that, that's a recipe for a disaster. But on the other hand, the fear on the part of the board and others there was that if you increase the tuition higher than it was, if you increase the total cost of attendance higher than it was, 
then you'd lose the students because they couldn't pay for it. A double whammy. So, that, there you go. A double whammy. That's, you know, the gift and the curse of being the HBCU. That's a challenge. That's a challenge. But the HBCU is needed in many ways as much as it's ever been. So leadership has to find a way to work through these challenges, uh, to do what is necessary. And, and our HBCUs are going to have to do as the other institutions are doing, look at the issues of mergers and consolidations and so forth uh, for survival. Uh, are there other institutions like mine? You know, people said to me, and one of the things I continue to hear is what happened in Selma uh, to keep the two private institutions, Selma University and Concordia College, Alabama, from doing more to help each other. Hold up, hold up Doc. I, I wanna, Doc, I want to pause your record just, just to make sure that our listeners know that Selma, Alabama had two HBCUs in there and still has one HBCU left. Like Dr. Lyons said, Selma University and Concordia College, two HBCUs in Selma, Alabama. Sorry about that, Doc. With, within walking distance. Mm. Because I have walked from one to the other. So within walking distance, you have two HBCUs. One lost its accreditation from SACS and the other closed. And I, so I've had people say to me, you know, but what happened? You know, why couldn't something have been done uh, right there in Selma? Now, sure, one of the, their different denominations, but the question becomes, as we look to the future, what are the things and creative things that HBCUs are going to have to do to ensure that they survive. Because again, I repeat, there's no guarantee uh, that our institutions will remain open. And of course, there's no guarantee that uh, other private institutions will remain open. You know, I've heard numbers as high as 200 uh, institutions, private institutions are expected to close in the next decade. I, wow. I've heard numbers wow. like that thrown, thrown around. Wow. And I can also say to your listening audience that as a result of the anticipated closures, there are law firms, and I don't mean this in a negative way to, to cast aspersions on law firms, but there are law firms really looking at this side of their practice Yeah. in terms of how do we get ready then to be supportive, to be helpful uh, if, if people are talking about that many schools closing over the next decade. So what do we have to do in our higher ed practices uh, to get ready? Dr. Lyons, how did, uh, how did the closure affect the uh, students and the alumni of Concordia? Well, you know, when I stood in front of the faculty, staff, and students uh, wow. that February of, of 2018 and told them that we were not going to be open beyond the current semester. Uh, it was the most difficult thing I've had to do in my 50 years of higher education because I knew that the impact would be tremendous. In fact, as I was waiting to make the comments to the, and discuss this with the campus, I was sitting in the front row of the auditorium and the uh, college chaplain was getting people's attention so that we could start the meeting. I actually heard a couple of students who were sitting behind me say, he's going to say we're closing. He's going to tell us that the college is closing. And I looked over my shoulder to see who had said that. And there was a couple of undergraduate students uh, who saw the handwriting on the wall and knew that there weren't many things that I could be calling everybody together to discuss. And that, that was tough because... You know, you had to think about, and I talked to my wife the night before. Obviously, I didn't sleep the night before. And we were talking about, you know, where would students go to school? How would they continue their education? What about staff members who have financial obligations? And 
Uh, they're going to come into a meeting and walk out unemployed, and they've got mortgages to pay. They've got children in college. Uh, what's going to happen to alumni that, in terms of their alma mater and uh, even basic things like how will alumni get their records and who will write letters of recommendations? All of that was a challenge and, and, and a real problem. I guess the good news is, is that, Thomas, that a lot of people stepped up to the plate to help. And, and, and that really, really made a difference. We had a, a college fair with nearly 50 colleges and universities from around the country. We had a, I don't mean a college fair, I mean a transfer fair. Mm -hmm. uh, we held this transfer fair to provide opportunities for the students for the following fall. And most of the schools that came to the transfer fair actually came prepared to admit our students on the spot if the students could present a, a, an unofficial transcript. And I walked through the gym and, and these, some of these schools had, you know, they had their computers set up. And if our students uh, uh, could present their unofficial transcript and they sat down and went over it, they were admitted on the spot. Uh, I have to tell you the story about a parent who called me uh, that same day. And she said, Dr. Lyons, I, my son, I know he thinks he's grown. He's a man. But I've got to call you and ask you a question because I don't understand what's happening. She said, this morning, I talked to him and he was depressed and down and out, really frustrated about the school closing and not having plans for the future. She said, and this evening, he called me smiling and laughing and said, Mom, I'm going to Alabama State University this fall. <laughs> And uh, she said, what? He said, yes, I, I'm going, I've been admitted to Alabama State. And she said, so Dr. Lyon, I just want to ask you, what happened? Is, is my son telling me the truth? And I said, yes, ma'am, he's telling you the truth. He came over to the transfer fair and brought a transcript, and Alabama State admitted him on the spot. But we had other schools doing the same thing. So any student, Thomas, and this is important, any student who was on the campus uh, during that transfer fair who wanted to go somewhere else, who wanted to transfer to another school uh, for that, last, that fall of, of 2018, all they had to do was to bring a transcript and they were able to leave that building admitted to another school. Now, obviously, other things come into play and how they get the finances and all of that, but right. any student who walked into that gym with an unofficial transcript was able to leave that gym admitted to another school for the fall. So schools stepped up, you know, not just the Concordia University system that uh, sent schools there, but we had schools like Dillard from out of state, Elizabeth City worked with us. Nice. Like I, said, like I said, Concordia, Nebraska, Concordia, Texas, Concordia, Chicago, Chicago Concordia, New York. and But in the state, the, the, the schools that really stepped up big time were Talladega, Miles, and Alabama mm -hmm. State. Alabama State came to the transfer fair with a mobile van with Alabama State on the side, and they came with job opportunities for faculty and staff, as well as wow. opportunities for students to transfer. Wow. They came with the HR department folk and the admissions folk to do whatever they could to help us out. That's, that's, so, that's wonderful. I'm telling you, man, it was a blessing to know the to watch your schools from around the country uh, step up and be supportive as they were. Well, Dr. Lyons, in closing, what do you have, you know, you know given the opportunity right now with, with, you know, with, you know, with, with the microphone to say to, say to the HBC alumni that are listening to this podcast right now? Well, you know, I say to the alumni, it is more important than ever before that you continue to help your alma mater. Uh, these schools need support. And even if you don't have big dollars, uh, 
whatever you can spare is important. And if you don't have the resources yourself, then reach out to somebody else. There are schools that have, uh, there are alumni who, who work at places that can make contributions and schools have matching programs so that if you or your employer make a contribution, the school will match that. Uh, there are uh, so many ways. Reach out to anybody that you know. Uh, you know people who, and I don't want to be morbid, but uh, we older Americans like myself who are beginning to think about, you know, or have already thought about their wills and estates. And, you know, talk to these people. you got folk in your church who uh, can be supportive. Um, so we really do have to be aggressive in terms of alumni support, because if you look at it collectively, that has not been a pretty picture. And it's very difficult for me as a college president to go to a foundation or a corporation asking for support. Yeah. And they and they ask me in turn, what percentage of your alumni contribute annually? Yep. And I and and it's more convenient for me to say, you know, I'll get that number and get back to you. Yep. Than it is for me to sit in the meeting and be embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, that has to stop. True words have not been spoken. You tell him, Dr. Lyons. That's right. That really is. I've, I've sat. I've sat there, and I've seen that. Um, and so schools have to do like uh, Claflin College's president did, and Dillard's president is doing. They really do have to step up and and make a a, a deliberate effort to increase the percentage of alumni giving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that's that got to happen. And, and and some of the folk out here with resources, I mean, you look at the, our celebrities and athletes who are signing these multi-million dollar contracts. I understand that everybody's after them. That, that's clear. Everybody is after them. But we've got to try to help uh, our brothers and sisters in those categories understand that, you know, you don't need 15 cars. <laughs> you, know, yep. you, you can only drive one vehicle at a time, I believe. And so, you know, you don't need 15 cars, you know. And, uh, look at our HBCUs uh, and, 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 and support them. Even if you didn't graduate from one of these institutions, they, they stand in need. And, and we've got folk out there with the wealth and with the resources that could make a difference overnight. Well, you have a 12-car garage, and we only have six cars. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Dr. Dr. James Lyons, uh, thank you for telling this story, and thank you for dropping the knowledge on our listeners today about uh, what can and what and what should not happen. Well, thank you, Thomas, and I, I appreciate your uh, giving me the opportunity. To, uh, this is the first time I have really uh, talked about this uh, situation at Concordia College in depth, and I, I appreciate your giving me that opportunity. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lyons. And we'll be back with more HBC Ubiquity. This is Thomas Joyner, Jr., and you're listening to the new HBC Ubiquity. Welcome back to HBC Ubiquity. Again, I want to thank Dr. James Lyons for his transparency and his frankness about the last days of Concordia College. I know that this was a hard conversation to partake in, but it's one that needed to be had. Higher education is becoming more competitive, more selective, and more expensive. And in case you're not aware, then I'm here to tell you. What's happening at Concordia is happening at non-HBCs across the country as well. When Concordia shut down, Concordia had a debt of $8 million to overcome. You have some college football coaches that make more than $8 million. But we also have other HBCUs that are not going to be shutting down in 2019 but are in some pretty dire straits as well. And if we're not careful, and I mean careful, I mean if we're not supportive, both monetarily as well as sending our children and grandchildren to, to enroll in these schools, we have about three or four more that just might be having to shut down for similar reasons over similar amounts of money in 2020. I'm Thomas Joyner Jr. Thank you for listening, and please come back on next week for another episode of HBC Ubiquity. Yeah, 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 yeah.